which has been delivered in partnership with the Thomas Pocklington Trust and the student loans company. It's a gorgeous day outside, but hopefully it'll be well worth you spending the next hour with us instead of what should be a useful and informative session. This session will be recorded and made available publicly afterwards. I will introduce our panel in a moment. But firstly, I just want to go through the access setup. We have uh, two British Sign Language interpreters with us today. And later, when we show a presentation, we'll make sure that one of the interpreters is spotlighted so they'll be on the screen throughout the presentation. There are captions available. If you cannot see them, you need to switch them on by clicking the CC button or um, going into the Zoom settings. The captions below are line by line, but you can also access a word by word transcript by clicking on a link that was emailed around this morning to everyone who registered for this. I'm Deb and I'm using the, the captions too. I have uh, an undergraduate degree and two uh, postgraduate qualifications. And I would not have achieved these without the funding that was available through disabled student allowances, or we call them DSAs for short. I've been talking a lot about DSAs today, including what they are exactly, and how to apply for them. We'll talk about the support that can be made available through DSAs. We will go through how COVID-19 is currently impacting DSA applications and the provision of support. And also, what other financial support may be available for deaf and vision impaired students. There will be a presentation from Amy and um, from a student loans company, and there will be a Q&A session. To ask a question, you will need to enter your question using the Q&A function in Zoom. You should see a Q&A icon on your screen. You can ask your question at any time and ask as many questions as you like Please don't be shy, there is no such thing as a silly question here. Only you and our panel can actually see your question and we'll try and answer as many questions as possible in the time that we have. We will be tweeting throughout the session and using the hashtag VI student finance. So if you tweet about this session, please use that hashtag. Now let's uh, introduce ourselves properly. So I work on education policy for deaf young people over the age of 14 at the Natural Deaf Children's Society. If you don't know the Natural Deaf Children's Society, we are the leading charity for deaf children and young people in the UK. Many people don't actually realise that we can support young people up to the age of 25. Young people, families or teachers can contact our helpline for advice and support on a range of issues, including support in higher education. I will now pass over to Tara to introduce herself and the Thomas Poppington Trust. Hi, thank you, Martin, and welcome everybody for, to this really, really, what should be a really brilliant session with the Student Loans Company. So my name is Tara Chatterway and I am the service manager for our student support service, which is a service for any student over the age of 16 that is either in or looking into enter higher or further education. And we have a whole range of resources on our website and we'll be circulating a link after this session. Um, but I'm really delighted to be able to welcome Tracy Horsfall and Amy Hedges from the Student Loans Company, who are first of all going to give us a, a presentation um, followed by a Q&A session. 
um, and I'm sure they are the ones that you're really wanting to hear from. So I'm going to hand over to both Amy and Tracy now so that they can introduce themselves. Um, apologies, we, uh, it's with technology, I just need Amy to unmute. Oh, technology is great when it works. <laughs> so I will fill this, this silence just while we just wait to um, get Amy on screen with her mic. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, let down by the technology there. Um, so my name is um, Amy Hedges and I've worked at the student loans company now for 12 years, um, so a long time. Um, and I've been working on the DFA department now for 10 years, so um, something that I've been involved in for a very long time. It was an area when I joined student loans company that I was really interested in moving towards because it, I do feel it, it's such a worthwhile um, product that we offer um, to support students um, whilst they're studying higher education. Um, I don't know if Tracy, I uh, don't know if her mic's working, I don't know if she wants to just say a few words. I think we'll maybe, shall I just start the, start the presentation? Thank you. So, um, as Martin said initially, um, this presentation is about the disabled student allowance, um, but, but DSA for short. Move on to the next slide. Thank you. So, in the presentation today, I'm going to talk you through what um, DSA is. I'm aware that some of you um, might have already applied for DSA. Some of you may even be in receipt of support at the moment. But I also know that some of you may be completely new to this, um, so might not know anything about it. So I want to cover off all of that in today's session. I'm also going to cover off um, how you apply for DSA and um, what the full process looks like. Um, what support might be available to you and then as Martin said um, some information about some other um, finance which might be available to you whilst you're at university. So there's a few things to note about DSA. DSA is a grant um, and it's designed to help you cover any essential additional costs that you have as direct result of your disability. So it doesn't depend on your household income. So a lot of student finance is assessed um, based on household income, but the DSA is not. So it's based solely on your needs um, and what support you need to, to help you at university. And the other thing that I want you to all be aware of is that DSA doesn't need to be repaid. So as long as you um, attend your course, um, you don't have to repay any of the, the funding that you get through the DSA allowance. It also doesn't affect um, your funding from any other aspects of DSA, so it's um, a product that is assessed completely, completely by itself. DSA is available to students who are on full-time, part-time and postgraduate courses. So if you're going to be studying one of those, you may be eligible for DSA. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about the types of support that you might be able to get from DSA. The way that we talk about DSA, we normally split it into four categories or four allowances. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what each of those is and what kind of things you might be able to get funded. So the first allowance is the specialist equipment allowance. This um, could be used to help you fund specialist software that you might need. 
So some of the types of software that we fund would be software which we refer to as text to speech. And what that would do is read out text from your computer um, aloud for you. You might also be able to fund um, specialist software for visual impairment, such as Dolphin Supernova, screen reading software, magnification software. And if you need any of that software, we can also provide funding towards the cost of a computer to run that for you. There's lots of other things that you can get through the specialist equipment allowance as well. Something like um, a braille display, um, a printer, scanner, things like that. Anything that you need um, to be funded through DSA is considered as part of your needs assessment, which I will talk to you about later on. The second allowance is something that we refer to as the non-medical helper allowance. Now what that essentially means is that it's support from a person, um, but it's not of a medical nature. So it might be somebody um, who, went, who attends lectures with you um, to support you during those lectures, like a BSL interpreter, or it might be specialist one-to-one -one tuition um, to help you um, on your course. That support wouldn't be specific to the subject you're studying, but around techniques to help you get the most out of your course. We also fund specialist note-taking. For example, if you have um, a hearing impairment or a visual impairment, we can fund a specialist note-taker um, and to help you access those lectures. The third allowance is the general allowance. It's really helpfully named um, because it's for general things. So one of the main things we pay out of that um, is additional printing costs. So you may find that you have to print more than other students on your course. You maybe need to print things in larger fonts um, or print out things more regularly. And in that case, we could give you some money to help you pay for that additional cost. The other thing that's paid out of the general allowance is your study needs assessment. But I'll talk about that later on in the presentation. The final allowance that we have is the travel exam allowance. So this might be because of your disability, you need to use a taxi to get to university rather than using public transport. In those cases, we'd be able to provide funding for that taxi and you would just pay the cost of the equivalent public transport. That's so that you're not incurring any additional costs compared to other students who would just use public transport. Now, all of these allowances are subject to caps of how much funding is available. And the cap is based on whether you are studying full-time, part-time, or on a postgraduate course. Most students do not use um, the maximum allowance that they're entitled um, to, but we'll determine that um, as part of your um, application process. Okay, thank you, Tara, next slide. Thank you. So I'm now going to talk to you about how you get your DSA support in place. Next slide. Thank you. So the DSA application process is really split into three constituent parts. There's the application, there's the assessment, and then there's the support that you receive. So I'm going to go into those in a little bit more detail. Next slide. Thank you. So the way in which you apply for your DSA support will depend on the type of course that you're studying and whether or not you're applying for other funding from Student Finance England. The easiest way to apply is to apply online and you can do that if you're a full-time student who is applying for a loan for tuition fees or maintenance. What will happen is when you apply online for your loan, you'll be asked a couple of questions which will ask you whether you want to apply for DSA as well. If you choose to, you'll then get a link in your My Account on your Student Finance England page, which will say apply for DSA. That link will stay there for as, as long as your application is live, so you don't have to apply straight away, but we would encourage you to apply as quickly as you can. When you choose to apply, all you need to do is log on to your student finance account, select that button, and then go through the application process. The online application is only three questions, so it's very quick. The first question asks you to indicate which category of condition you'd like to apply for. 
and that's just a multiple choice tick box. The second question is a free type box. And in there, all you need to do is say what condition you want to apply for, and you can add as many as you want separately. The third and final question is really important. We call the third question consent to share. Consent to share is about allowing us to speak to the other people who will be fundamental in getting your DSA support in place. These are your disability advisor at your university, your needs assessor, and the providers of your support. We'll ask you to indicate whether you give your consent for us to share information with them directly, or whether you would like to choose not to. It's really important to know that you don't have to give consent for us to share information, and there will be no delay in your application if you choose not to do so. Anything we do share with these people though, will be kept confidential, and will just help us to get your support in place. You can choose at any time to change that decision. So if you give consent initially, you're free to withdraw it at any time whatsoever. And if you choose not to initially, you can always add that back on later on. If you're a part-time student or a postgraduate student, or if you're an undergrad student who doesn't want to apply for a loan, you'll need to apply for your DSA on paper. I've put the link in there, which you can click on, um, and that will take you to the section of the DirectGov website where you can download the form. The paper form contains a lot more information than the online form because we need to establish which course you're on um, and your eligibility, which for online applicants, we would get through their online application. There is a section in the paper form which your HEP needs to complete to confirm which course you are attending. Now we understand at this point um, that you may not be able to take that, that part of the application form to your university to get completed. So if you can't, just send the form into us as it is and we will contact your university on your behalf and get them to confirm that information via email. The second part of the application process is for you to submit evidence of your disabilities and there's three ways that you can do that. The first way is a digital upload function which has recently been added to the online application. That works the same way as, as many other websites that you might see where you can just attach a file from your PC or from your phone. We also accept medical evidence via email and the email address is provided within the presentation. Alternatively, you can also send your evidence to us via post. It's important to know that there is no um, preference given to the way you submit your evidence, so just do it in the way that's most convenient for you. Next slide. Thank you. We understand at the moment that you might not be able to get new evidence um, so what you should do is send us evidence that you already have so that we can check it and if we did need anything additional we would let you know. At the moment it's taking us about three to five days to review medical evidence that's sent in to us so we will get back to you and we'll tell you if there's anything additional that we do need. Remember you don't need to send us original copies of disability evidence so if you are sending something in the post it's absolutely fine to send us a photocopy for evidence. The type of evidence that we need will depend on what conditions you want to apply for. And the types of evidence fits into three main categories. We accept diagnostic reports, letters from GPs or medical professionals, and then we've also developed an SFE disability form, which you can take to your GP to get completed. Next slide. This slide just shows the types of evidence um, that we can accept based on the condition that you would be applying for. So diagnostic reports need to be written in line with some guidance, which is outlined by an organization called SASC, but there's loads more information about that on our website. If you're getting evidence from a medical professional, you need to make sure that it's clear who's written it and also that it gives a clear diagnosis. We did find that some of our customers struggled with getting appropriate medical evidence 
And although they were going to see their GP, the evidence that the GP was writing really wasn't sufficient for what we needed. So that's why we developed the SFE disability evidence form. If you go, need to go and see your GP to get new medical evidence, you can take that form with you. And we designed that in a way that if a GP fills that out, that should give us all the information that we need to determine your eligibility. Next slide. So once we've received and reviewed your application and your evidence, we will send you an eligibility letter. What this does is explain the next steps of what you need to do to get your DSA support in place. The first thing that you need to do is book an appointment at a needs assessment centre. We've developed an online course code search, which allows you to select a centre that you choose. Now you can put whichever postcode you like into that postcode search. You could use your home postcode or were you to be um, studying away at university, you could use your university postcode. The link to that postcode search will be provided to you in your eligibility letter. Once you select a centre, the postcode search has the details for you to be able to contact them. So there's a phone number and an email address and you can contact them and book in an appointment. Now during that appointment, you'll meet with a needs assessor. Now a needs assessor is somebody who is experienced and who has a lot of insight into the world of HE. Usually these needs assessments and this, this meeting would take place face to face, but all of our centres are now able to offer them by a video call so that these can continue to take place while social distancing restrictions are in place. One of the things I really want you to remember is that the needs assessment and the, this meeting is not a test. It's just to help you decide what support would help you on your course. The needs assessor will do some research in advance and will have looked at what your course involves and might have gained some information about the specific um, university that you intend to go to. They'll have a conversation with you about what things you're worried about or what things you think could help you. There'll then be a discussion and they may demonstrate some software or some equipment to you and then they will make some recommendations which they will send through to us. You will have the opportunity um, beforehand to review those recommendations before they're sent to us if that's something that you choose to do. Next slide. Once the needs assessor has sent that report through to us um, at Student Finance England, we will review that and we will determine what support can be agreed. We'll then write to you and tell you exactly what you've had agreed and how to get that support in place. That letter will come through to you via email, so watch out for it, um, and then you can start to organise your support. There'll be phone numbers and email addresses in that letter so that you can contact the providers and arrange the support at a time that's convenient for you. Many of our providers have been able to adapt the way they deliver their services. So we have students having their one-to-one -one support remotely by video phone, and the companies that we use to deliver equipment have been able to put processes in place so that this can still be delivered during this time. The providers will then invoice Student Finance England for any of the support that you've been provided and will pay for it on your behalf. There is no need um, for you to pay anything out in advance. All those invoices will just be paid by us. Your support will continue for the duration of your course um, but if your needs change, we can always review what's been agreed for you. So you may feel that your needs change as you progress through your course, or you may transfer course for, from one um, that's maybe um, more academic to something that's a little bit more practical. We can always re review your support at any point and make sure that it's as appropriate as it needs to be. If you continue um, studying after an undergrad course and maybe come back for a postgrad, course, we can also review that support as well then to make sure that it's still appropriate. Next slide. So I'm just going to talk to you briefly about what other financial support um, is available through Student Finance England. Thank you. So full-time students can apply for 
tuition fee loans to help cover the cost of your tuition fees. They can also apply for a maintenance loan, which is an amount of money which is paid to you directly in three instalments. I mean, you can use that for whatever purpose you like. Many students use that to cover the cost of their rent or other living costs while they're at university. Full-time students can also apply for additional support if they have caring responsibilities. So if a student had children that needed to be in childcare while they were studying, or if they had an adult who was dependent on them, they might be able to get additional support. There's a lot more information about that um, on the link provided on the direct website. Part-time students can also apply for a tuition fee loan to cover the cost of their tuition fees. What this means is that the tuition fee can be paid upfront by Student Finance England, and then you will repay it once you complete your course. Part-time students can also apply for a maintenance loan, um, as with full-time students to help them with any living costs. And postgraduate students can apply for a postgrad master's loan or a postgrad doctoral loan, um, and they can use that to cover their fees or, or to cover their living costs. Next slide. The application process um, has remained mostly the same for um, student finance, um, even in light of the, the COVID situation. So we still need evidence um, to be able to assess um, applications. Um, we might need additional evidence from sponsors. So if you are applying for um, a means tested proportion of funding, then we might need evidence from um, a, par a parent or a partner. And we've just said that it's important to remember that although we need this evidence and your application will be paused until we receive it, you won't be financially penalised by sending information in at a later date. So don't worry too much if you don't have anything at the moment. Next slide. When can I apply? So full-time applications are um, open now and we'd encourage you to apply as soon as you can. For part-time and postgraduate loans, um, they will be opening in June as expected. It's important to note that the DSA applications for full-time, part-time and postgraduate are open now, so you can apply for your DSA now. And we always urge you to make an early application. We do know though at the moment that some people might not be 100% um, sure whether they will be studying in September or where they will be studying. We still encourage you to apply based on the course that you think you might be going to study in September because it's really easy to switch that course over or even switch the, the university that you're going to be attending later on. But leaving the whole application until later could mean that we wouldn't have the support in place for when you started. So apply and then we can change it if we need to. And if you don't end up going to university in September, there won't be any penalty for that. We can just cancel the application right up to when you would um, register um, with no impact to you whatsoever. Next. Thank you. There's more information um, and a lot of resources. We're very active on Facebook at the moment. There's a lot of information on there that we're sharing with customers. And we have a phone line which is open Monday to Friday um, and at 10 till half past five. And if you have any DSA specific questions, you can also email those in. And there's lots of information on gov.uk and Student Room. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, I'm just starting my video, sorry. Thank you so much, Amy. That was really, really useful. And I know that I learned quite a lot through that presentation as well. And I, I really hope that everybody else has who's attending. Um, we are having lots and lots and lots of questions coming through. Um, and um, I just want to reiterate what Martin said at the beginning. that If we can't, don't get through all of these questions, Student Loans Company have agreed to take them away and answer them and we will produ be producing a question and answer sheet that will be hosted on our website and we'll send you links and details to that as well. Um, so if it's okay, um, Amy, I'll um, just take these through in, in order. Um, so our first um, question is from George and he says, I'm not taking out the postgraduate student loan. I am self-funding for tuition fees. Can I still access disabled students allowance? Yes, 
Absolutely. Um, there isn't any prerequisite to get any other funding from student finance to be eligible for DSA. So you can go and download the application form now um, and make your application for postgrad DSA. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, the, the second question is um, to do more with specialist equipment. So would specialist equipment also cover additional lighting required in accommodation for visually impaired students? It would depend on, on the specific nature of the need. Um, so we do fund um, some additional lighting, for example, um, a daylight task lamp, if, if a, a student needed that um, whilst they're in accommodation. But I think with that one, we'd have to look at the specifics. Um, if it was something that maybe the accommodation provider should be providing as a reasonable adjustment, it might fall under that. But the best um, advice I could give with that is to, to make sure that you mention that when you go along to meet with your needs assessor, um, they'll be able to look at the specifics of that. Um, and then if they think it's appropriate, they can always recommend that we fund that through the DSA. Okay, thank you. I, I won't ask you to answer this at the moment because I want to get through the, the questions of the panellists, but I think quite often there is a confusion between which universities can provide and what uh, DSA can provide, so perhaps we can provide some clarification for that as part of our answers. Um, the next question is from Lucy and she says, how much is the cap for DSA and would this cover the cost of a full-time BSL interpreter? The, there's a cap for each individual allowance, so depending on the type of course that you're going to study, um, it would be based on that. So but just as an indication for a full time undergraduate student, um, the cap for the non medical help, which is where the BSL would be paid from, um, is about £20,000 a year. So I appreciate in most cases that probably wouldn't cover the, the cost of a full time BSL interpreter. Um, but what really um, can be done in those situations is it's a, a good idea to go and speak to your university and see what support they might be able to, to put in place to help you cover, cover that cost. Unfortunately, we're um, bound by regulation in much, and how much funding we can give um, from the DSA. But I do know that students can sometimes seek funding from, from other sources to, to help cover that cost. Okay, thank you, Amy. So the, the next question is from an anonymous attendee, and this is regarding the consent to share permissions that you discussed at the beginning. Um, and so they wanted to know, what are the advantages or disadvantages of sharing or not sharing? That's the first part. And the second part of the question is, what are the advantages or disadvantages of sharing with each of the three specified categories of personnel? So I think it, it's really important to say that um, it is a very personal preference. Um, so if you do not want to share your information, then you are you are very free to do so. So I, I wouldn't want to give ad, ad, advice, but I can certainly say how we would use um, the consent if, if it were given. So what it allows um, us to do, um, and I'll talk through the three types of, of groups you can give it to. So if you were to give consent to your disability advisor at your university, for a start, we would send them a copy of your agreement letter when we've agreed what support um, you can have. So that will enable them to um, contact you and help you to get that support in place. It also means that the disability advisor could ring up um, on your behalf um, and discuss your application. So if you had any questions, you could go and see them and then they could contact us and we could discuss the specifics of your account. The same with the needs assessor. If you give your consent, we will um, be able to answer direct questions from them um, about your account. If you don't, we, um, we can't discuss your account directly with them, so we would kind of need to use you as um, an intermediary, really. Um, and with the supplier, um, it means that they could um, contact us and ask us questions about, for example, how many hours of support you had left, um, and when your course was, was due to finish. So it makes things a little bit easier if, if you give us your consent to share that information, but it certainly doesn't mean that you can't um, get your support in place or there's, there's anything you're going to miss out on if you don't. It just makes it a little bit easier if we can have those conversations as a round um, rather than just having to speak to you and then you have to go and speak to people, if that makes sense. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, this is a, 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 a question from Abby Rose. 
um, a fault in an account which is set up a set up meant that um, her blind mum has been a, unable to access her account. So this is a student that's applying and her mum has a visual impairment. Um, a call to student finance has not been helpful and she's been, she's been told to fill in a print copy and there's no alternative. This has delayed my support to Christmas time and the process was inexplicable. How do we get over these barriers this year? Um, I think that's probably more to do with um, the, the finance for the loans, um, which I'm not particularly familiar with, um, but I do know that parents need to log on and um, give support information to, to allow the income assessment um, for your loans. So I'm really sorry that, that she's experienced those difficulties. Um, I don't know why um, her mum wasn't able to, to use the, the online system or why we've advised um, to, to use a paper form, but um, I can certainly take that back and have a look into it. I don't know if it's possible for us to get um, contact details first. Well, we can check questions like that, Ella. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. If, she's, if she's happy to, yes. Yeah. And we can share those, absolutely. Yeah, and I'll, I'll get that looked into because I'm not sure what, what's gone wrong with that particular circumstance. Okay, so this is an anonymous question. So this is, is it useful to get a report from um, a qualified teacher of vision impairment or a qualified teacher of hearing impairment? So I should imagine this is the beginning of the assessment process. Um, it, it might be helpful, um, but we don't usually accept that as, as evidence by itself. Um, we would need it to be from a, a medical professional. So um, it's probably best to, to get the evidence from, from a GP or a consultant um, or some other medical professional of, of that nature, as that would be the, the requirement in terms of evidence. Something like that would be helpful for the needs assessor to see. Um, when they do um, the, the sort of overview and um, that might give them some helpful insight but we wouldn't be able to accept that as evidence of your eligibility. So you could as evidence of a visual or hearing impairment but it could be used in the assessment process as additional information to advise the assessor on what equipment or support that student may need. Yes exactly yeah we always encourage the needs assessor to to get a very rounded um, picture of of the student and um, something like that would be very very insightful but it wouldn't it wouldn't be evidence for for the process. Great um, the next question so this is um, follows on from the, the last one this is from an anonymous attendee if you have a hearing impairment would the following ed evidence be sufficient so dated information from the teacher of the deaf and a letter from the audiology stating diagnosis. Yes, obviously without seeing the specific letter, but yes, um, evidence from an, an audiologist um, would be acceptable um, evidence for us to be able to determine eligibility. Okay, great. Um, and would you recommend, because you discussed those two forms, would, uh, that you had a form that could be taken to the medical person, would you recommend using that form rather than relying on a, a, a letter from a professional? Yeah, if the, the advice that we have is that if you have evidence already, then send that in um, because we'll be able to review that. And if that's suitable, then that, that's fantastic. But if you were to be going to a doctor or a, or a specialist um, to get additional evidence, um, that form is really useful. We've just been really conscious that we don't want to um, mandate that form up front because we do um, appreciate that sometimes a GP, for example, would charge a customer um, to have that filled in. So we would always encourage you to send out anything that you have um, and then we can make that determination about anything extra. But if you were going initially to get some evidence, then that form is, is really helpful because it does ensure that the, the doctor or GP gives us um, all the information that we need GPs aren't, as a rule, um, particularly familiar with DSA, so they wouldn't know what our evidence requirements are, which is why we developed that form in conjunction with um, stakeholders in, in the sector, because we understood students were struggling a little bit. Okay, thank you. Um, so, question you did touch upon in your presentation. Um, so, this one is, while COVID-19 restrictions are in place, our needs assessors able to continue to conduct face-to-face um, -face meetings? 
it's um some need assessment centres may be offering face-to-face -face, um, assessments, but at the moment, the majority of them are um, being conducted remotely via, via video call, such as um, a facility like we're using today. All of the, the need assessment centres are um, companies which are totally separate to student loans company. So I'm not privy to which ones might be offering face-to-face -face, and it wouldn't really be appropriate for me to Give advice about whether that is appropriate under the, the current government guidelines but if you contact um, a centre and they're not offering face-to-face -face, um, assessment you can always um, book in with them for an uh, assessment at a future date and um, if you didn't want to have a remote one but the feedback from a lot of the centres and from our customers is that the remote um, appointments such as this are, are working really well for them so hopefully you would still be able to get as much out of a remote one as a face-to-face, -face, but you're perfectly free to wait um, until they're available face-to-face -face if that's your preference. Great, thank you. This next um, question is from an anonymous attendee, but this is one that's been raised many times through our service uh, as well, is how is the reapplication for DSA organised if needs change? So I suppose that's if your course changes, you realise you need more support or that your disability changes in some way, how can you go back through that process to get the support you need? The, the first thing I would advise in that situation is to contact your needs assessor. So the person that you meet with initially, um, they will be your needs assessor for, for the duration of your course and you should be provided with their contact details or you will have the details of the centre that they work at. So the first thing I would advise is to, to contact them um, and they will be able to discuss any change of need with you um, and see what additional support can be put in place. If it's just um, a change of need because there's um, a change in your course or actually something that was recommended initially didn't quite work out for you, they could just make that recommendation straight to Student Finance England. They can send those in via email and we deal with those in sort of a few days um, time so you should get a response pretty quickly on that if your needs are changed because um you'd had a significant worsening of your condition or um you subsequently been diagnosed with an additional condition we might need you to submit new medical evidence or new evidence of that condition to us but the needs assessor will be able to talk to you about the specifics of that and support you in getting that evidence to us it would depend on whether you needed to submit submit new medical evidence but to be clear you don't have to go through the full process um over again you don't have to send in a new application form and we'd only need new evidence if it was for a significant worsening or a new condition other than that you can just contact your needs assessor okay, thank you um we've got a lot more questions that are still coming in so we've definitely um <laughs> got this uh, full hour covered um, how do you apply for a maintenance loan? Uh, Tracy, would you be able to? Right, so um, if it's so uh, just to let everybody know at the moment, we have Amy who specialises in the disabled students allowance and Tracy who specialises in all of the other loans and maintenance who stepped in at the last moment this morning. Um, but we're having some difficulties getting her through so we might have to park that question come back to it later or yeah, make I, sure that's I've, i can definitely give general advice on that um it's just i wouldn't be with the um sort of uh, specifics of it but the um applications for full-time undergraduate students are online um as i'm as i mentioned in my presentation so you can go to gov.uk and um, sign up for a student finance account if you haven't got one log on and then make the application um, online um, and you just fill in your course details um, and any other information that we need um, and that's all managed online as i mentioned there's a now uh, evidence upload um, facility so if you needed to send any evidence to support the application you can upload your evidence um, into the application as well thank you and um the next question is uh, for Jenny, and this is, how is BSL interpreting for deaf students going to be provided if courses are online or blended learning? 
I, I don't necessarily think that's a question I can answer, unfortunately. Um, we would be responsible for funding it, um, but I think it would be for the, the universities um, and the providers to sort of determine how that would work. Okay, but it, given that the COVID situation that we're in, the assessments will be based on all of those eventualities, I suppose, that might be one of the concerns that, that students are having. Yes, I think um, that the, the assessors are very um, aware of the, the challenges that, that some customers are, are going to face next year if, if all the courses um, are online. Um, so that'll be taken into account when, when they're making those recommendations, yeah. Um, so the the next question is, are there any options for international students? Are there any alternatives to the travel allowance for international students? So I suppose that's a broader question about how international students can, if they can, apply to student finance. Um, it depends on, on how um, a student is eligible for student finance. So if you are eligible for the full package of student finance from FFE, so the, the loans and grant, your DSA would be um, administered in exactly the same way uh, as any other, any other student. Um, if you're not eligible for funding from Student Finance England, then that would also mean that you're not eligible for DSA support, which would include um, the travel allowance. So you would need to look for um, additional funding sources um, to help you um, with funding that you needed on your course. Thank you, Amy. Um, and the, the next question is from Isabel and she says, how can I apply for DSA for postgraduate part-time course when I do not want to apply for a loan? Can we have a link to the form as I can't find it on the SLC website? Thank you. Yes, so the, there is a link um, in my presentation, which I believe we're going to make um, eligible, uh, available, sorry, um, online following this session. Um, it's just a, a form finder, so it's um, a few multiple point, multiple choice questions, um, and then that will help you find um, the form that you that you need to complete. Um, it's a full form, um, and you can apply for the DSA in isolation without needing to apply for any other funding. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this this next question is from Kirsty, and she says that specialist equipment you have in sixth form from your local authority. How does that crossover work? Can you get equipment ready for your first day in university? Yes, so um, I wouldn't know whether you would, um, what would happen with that equipment you've already got. I would imagine um, that it probably would need to be handed back um, to the local education authority, um, but it's best to probably check with them. In terms of your DSA equipment, one of the reasons we encourage students to apply early is so that they can get that or, um, all organised and ready for your first day at university. So if you haven't already applied, um, I'd encourage you to get your application in. We'll be able to assess it and then you'll be able to have your um, meeting with your needs assessor. Once we um, tell you what you're eligible for, you can then contact the supplier and, and arrange that delivery. Um, and suppliers do have um, a service level that they have to adhere to, so you should, um, should be able to get that support in place and that equipment delivered um, prior to you starting in September. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this is a question from Jenny. Can DSA be contacted in British Sign Language, for example, via remote interpreting services? Um, at the moment, that's something that we're looking into. So you can contact us um, via email, via text phone um, but at the moment we don't have um, a BSL relay um, that's readily available but that's something that I've raised um, and something that's getting looked into um, as a matter of urgency but those other channels um, are available at the moment. Okay great thank you Amy. I'm just going to say that we're it's uh, 10 to 12 now so we'll take five more minutes of questions and then we will have to um, close for the close this session. Um, so um, anonymous attendee, my postgrad course is Physician Associate Studies, which is a lot of placements in GP surgery and hospitals. Would this be taken into account if I was looking for help affording additional equipment for my hearing, such as a Roger pen or Bluetooth hearing aid? It is quite a different environment than a lecture theatre. 
Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that the needs assessor takes into account when they when they meet with you is all those differences in, in people's courses. So they'll look at what placements you, you might be attending or field trips, uh, maybe even you know study abroad um, that, that might mean that your needs change. So the needs assessor will be able to take all that um, into account when, when they're determining what support um, they can recommend from, from the DSA and support for placements um, could very well be covered by us. Um, especially if you're attending lots of different different placements um, and those needs will be so different from being in a, in a lecture theatre. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is from an anonymous attendee and says that where consent to share is not agreed and um, suppliers of the support do not get paid, can Amy confirm that this is the case please? Um, so was there anything more about the support not getting paid? Yeah, I think the question is is based on that person's experience, maybe, that where they've not received their consent to share, that the supplies of the support have not paid. And can you confirm whether that's the case, please? Um, it may be that that person um, maybe got support previously, um, and students did used to have to give consent for us to pay suppliers, but that support no longer, that, that um, consent no longer exists. So we, we can pay suppliers without consent. Um, it's not a specific consent anymore because we can pay suppliers without actually sharing any information about the customer with that supplier. So we can pay um, invoices for suppliers um, without you needing to give consent for us to share information with them. Great, thank you. I, I will say that if somebody has been a question and we have not been able to interpret it correctly, then please do. Um, email the student support service and we can pass on um, the more details to Amy and her team. Um, so what are DSA, DSA loans like for an invisible e illness such as chronic fatigue syndrome and the, st and the stigma that sufferers are faking it? So I suppose this will be if people have got additional needs on top of their VI or if they, they are um, applying for chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, um, the, the DSA is, is available to, to students with so many um, different um, complex disabilities and with multiple disabilities we actually find a lot of customers now apply for multiple conditions and um, there's certainly no perception that, that somebody would be faking something um, like that. So somebody who's applying for any chronic fatigue or any unseen disability would be treated exactly the same uh, as anybody else. Um, and the needs assessors are experienced in all these different conditions. So they know um, what it's like to experience these things and how they can impact. So they'll be able to make the recommendations that are more suitable um, for you to, to help you on your course. Thank you, Amy. I think we just take two more questions and then I think we're going to have to, to close the session. Um, this one is from Sarah and it says, um, Hi, my centre seems to have a charge of £600 plus um, to DSA assess my daughter for her undergraduate course. Do we have to fund the assessment? Thank you so much for answering that question because I meant to cover it in my presentation and got. So yes, centres do have a fee um, for carrying out the, the needs assessment, which I mentioned in my presentation. The fees um, are outlined per centre on the postcode search, which I talked about. So you'll be able to see what fee everybody charges. But it's really important to know that you don't have to pay that fee. So that fee is paid for by your DSA, by your general allowance portion. So you don't have to pay that up front. Once your needs assessment's completed, the centre will just invoice us and we'll pay that on your behalf because it's a fundamental part of, of your DSA application. So you don't need to pay that up front. Thank you, Amy. And we'll take this one last question. Um, many deaf signers report their DSA budget does not cover the cost of full-time sign language interpreters. Deaf signers describe experiencing stress and anxiety because of uncertainty about their interpreting support. And some students also say their university is not helpful in resolving this problem. What has been done to address this funding shortfall? And that's from Francis. Thank you, Francis, for, for asking that question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the support that, that Student Finance England can give in, in that regard is um, capped 
um, and that is subject to um, regulation. So we cannot pay um, above that amount, unfortunately. But I, I do appreciate that that can cause um, difficulties for, for customers who need full-time BSL um, interpreting. I know that um, representations are made um, sorry, <coughs> to, um, to the government and things, but unfortunately it wouldn't be within um, student loans companies' gift to, to change that. So unfortunately we can't um, do anything about that other than to make it clear up front about how much support um, is possibly going to be needed and how much it could cost so that um, students can work with other parties to, to try and get additional funding in place. Thank you. I think oh, that would be the last question, but I've just seen one which I think actually is probably one that a lot of people will probably be asking, and, and that's Lucy. And is, is it possible to apply for more than one category of DSA if the support is needed? It, is that in so, more than one condition? I think that's in terms of your um, presentation at the beginning, you talked about there's four different categories that you can receive. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So sorry if I wasn't clear on that. The, the DSA is, is the whole thing. And then we just talk about the, the four different allowances, but you can apply for all of them and get a package which encompasses all four. Just one, two or, or three. It'll just be based on, on those conversations with the needs assessor and, and what you need. Okay, great. Thank you so much, um, Amy, for taking the time. I'm just starting my video. Thank you so much, Amy, for taking the my time to, to come and talk to us. And I, there are lots and lots more questions that we didn't have time to ask, but I just would like to, to reiterate that we absolutely will be looking at all of those questions and providing a Q&A sheet. I'd also like to say that if you did ask a question and you didn't feel that it was answered in the way that you intended, there will you can get in touch with our student support team and we will pass those questions on to Amy or put you in touch with Amy if it's more of a, a, a some issues that you need to get immediately addressed. Thank you so much, Amy, for for your time, for your really informative presentation, and for those really detailed um, answers. I really hope that everybody participating today found it as useful and as informative as, as I did. Um, and I'm sure that your mind will be buzzing afterwards and you'll have more questions to ask and more information to find. So we will make sure that we put the presentation and the recording of today on our website and we will send a link to you all. Please bear with us because it will take a little bit longer to get all the Q&As written up and make sure that we've got the, the right answers, but we will again share that with you. Um, just to do a quick plug for our student support service, um, please do email studentsupport at pocklington-trust.org.uk if you do have any questions. Um, and also we have a Facebook uh, group for students to come together to ask questions and provide support and so we'll send a link to that as well so it'll be a place for you to to come together and perhaps continue the discussions that we've had today so i would just like to take this time then to thank you thanks our pat thank our panelists so thank martin and um, amy thank you to our interpreters and everybody else that's helped to make this session a success um, and um, I look forward to speaking to you many, many of you um, later after this event. So thank you so much and enjoy the sunshine and the afternoon. <laughs>